FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's 8-14-18. Well, it's beginning to look a lot like idiocracy. But first, before we get into that, feel free to send your emails, comments, criticisms, feedback, etc. to kl at kerrylutz.com. Idiocracy movie that was done, I believe, in the 90s and it's all about cryogenics, uh, freezing people who are then revived in the future and lots of interesting things happen. Uh, it's about the gene pool, hurting, thinning out of the gene pool herd, many other things. Well, Dr. John Huber is with us now to discuss it. And Dr. Huber, welcome back. Well, thank you for having me back, Carrie. I appreciate it. A pleasure. Definitely. A pleasure. So, idiocracy. Uh I gave a brief summary of it. Maybe you could just go through it a little bit better than I did. Right. And Idiocracy actually was released in 2006. It's a Mike Judge film, and that came out a year before smartphones were released. So, you know, it's it's 2018 now. Smartphones have been around for 11 years, and they've <laughs> significantly impacted our culture and our society and the world. But in this movie... They didn't have the smartphones and all that kind of stuff. But what took over was uh, the government essentially got over a long period of time, this person got froze and woke up and government had been basically subjugated by corporate America. In fact, uh, people could actually sell advertising space on their forehead. Uh, I mean, that badly. And uh, it got to the point where this great corporation, Gatorade, had gotten the government to purchase Gatorade to use the water farms, irrigate farms. Uh, every water or water fountain yeah. that people drank out of was full of Gatorade. And the whole reason why, well, it has electrolytes. It's full of electrolytes. Yeah, it's good and it's it got so driven by corporate entities putting their own needs in front of societies that um, there was waste problems everywhere. There were um, starvation problems because uh, Gatorade is not a good wait a, uh, water. Wait a second. Are you, it's not good for, <laughs> are you telling me that Gatorade is not a better substitute for watering crops than water? That they won't exactly. live? Exactly. Are you sure? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about this. Uh, I'm having problems accepting this. <laughs> okay. Well, let me see. What what else has electrolytes? Well, urine does. And I can tell you when my dog goes and pees in different areas of my yard, the grass dies. So Really? So, so maybe yeah. electrolytes, it's kind of like people say, well, it's natural. It must be good for you. But cyanide. That's what they would say. Yeah. Cyanide <laughs> occurs in nature and strychnine and uh, scores of other poisons. Asbestos. Yeah. So you maybe, know, uranium. Hey, yeah. let's just go on the list, right? Cobalt. Yeah. All these things. <laughs> and you know, maybe it's not a good idea to take them because even though they're natural, they'll kill you. So idiocracy, they, it's a regression of, of human intellect where they're showing in the beginning, if I remember the movie correctly, uh, a highly educated, like yuppie couple. And they said, well, we'll wait to have kids. We'll just wait. And they wait and wait. And then they're trying to have kids and they never can. So their genes, higher quality genes, better intellect genes don't get passed on. But then you've got like the total loser genes and they just seem to have yeah. no problem propagating. And in 20 generations, pretty much the average IQ sinks to like 80. And then this could be right. <laughs> so exactly. And you know, and it, it's, it's great because about the time this came out, the onion published an article that said if both parents did not graduate from high school, that, that we're averaging over six kids per family, 
And if both parents have a college degree, we're having less than one per family. So it kind of mirrored that. And, and I used it in my college lecture in, immediately after Ooh. this movie came out and was talking to my students saying, please, you know, you have to keep the gene pool <laughs> going. There's no fresh. lifeguard. You have to be it. <laughs> no lifeguard at the gene pool, which is the headline of this interview. So uh, obviously this is a racist thing, but look, most of the problems of the inner city, drug addiction, homeless, criminality, uh, abuse, the list goes on and on, accrues to individuals in a single parent, usually a mother, family. I mean, that is the truth of the matter. So idiocracy You're isn't that far from the truth. Yeah, if you're a single parent, uh, a mother, your kids are 80 times more likely to do time behind bars than somebody who has both parents. And the research shows both, it doesn't matter if it's a gay or lesbian couple. If you have two parents, they're going to compensate for the weaknesses of the other parent. And the whole thing is if, if the parents love the kid, the kid's going to come out okay for the most right. part. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's funny it, that research doesn't show true with a single father. And the reason why is most dads walk in and say, hey, this is the rules. I'm, you know, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. I'm sorry you don't like it, but that's the way we're in. But a mother walks in and says, hey, we got to be a team. We're going to work through yeah. this together. Very democratic. Unfortunately, pseudo adultism kicks in and kids quit talking to mom about making decisions and they just start making decisions and they're not prepared exactly. to make those decisions uh, for brain development reasons, experience reasons uh, and, and educational reasons on top of that. Hey, there is a movie uh, one time, Boiler Room, based on the Wolf of Wall Street before that movie book came out. And... Mm -hmm. Hal Rifkin is the father and he's a judge and he says to his son, who's, you know, young adult, I guess in his early twenties, he says, Hey, I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to tell you when you screw up. And to me that resonated so well, cause I was a single father raised three kids myself who turned out amazing, but that's neither here nor there. But I told my kids on more than one occasion, hey, I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to tell you when you screw up and make you face the consequences of it. So hopefully when you're on your own, you won't be screwing up anymore. And uh, Well, and part of that facing consequences is teaching them how to deal with failure and screwing up. And if you do, then it's not really failure or screwing up. It's, exactly. a, it's a learning stone. You know, you step over it and you figure out how to deal with life. And so you don't need mom and dad there. And once they become adults, and by the time they're in their 30s, you do have friends. You know, yeah. the, your, your son and daughter become your friends because exactly. you've all matured. Yeah, like where we've evolved to now, my, my daughters are each in their 30s, and my son's uh, mid-20s, and I'm like a trusted advisor to them. You know, when they mm -hmm. have a problem, they come to me. And I tell them what I think, uh, you know, my opinion, which they're free to take or not take. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, I'm not in it to score brownie points. I tell them what I think. And that's why they come to me in the first place. I'm not passing judgment. I'm not here to tell them what I think they should or shouldn't do. Really important, important things. Hey, so we talked about, uh, about single motherhood, really bad thing because kids need the male moderating force in their lives, regardless whether they're gay or straight, regardless whether right. they're white or black, it makes no difference. Those statistics that you cited hold true to people, regardless of their socio socioeconomic level as well. Although Correct. the poorer you are, the more likely you are to get into trouble with no male role model at home. And it doesn't even matter if they've gone to through the formalities of marriage, you know, saying I do, taking the vows. It just matters that the father is present in the home, regardless how the bond has been uh, formed and well, formalized. You know, with some exceptions, you get those absentee fathers who are there. And for example, we had the Austin bomber and that yeah. was one of the things that, that was significant in this individual. And most serial killers have some sort of yes. absentee parenting on the father's side and things like that. So it can be problematic oh, yeah. even if dad's there, but 
but not we're involved. we're talking actively involved parent. Yeah, okay, yeah, then, so actively involved. You're correct. And a yeah. nuclear nuclear style family, even if it isn't doesn't comport with purely with the definition of the nuclear family, right. which is a mother, a father, and you might have a grandparent that steps in there, that uh, exactly. a grandfather that could be the surrogate father. Doesn't matter. So. Uh, and by the way, 26 out of the last 27 school shooters uh, all did not have fathers. So uh, I don't know if that's proof or it's, if it's anecdotal evidence that become, rises to the level of proof, but it's more than a coincidence. And we could also talk about SSRIs that all of these kids have been exposed to. We don't know if the SSRIs are causation or just... Uh, or otherwise, but we do know that the father not being there is causation, almost certainly. So whether it's well, why it happens, we could debate, but it's a fact. So right, exactly. So I've been right. I mentioned to you pre-call that I've been writing some articles about how to cure homelessness on the streets of America, and you're in Austin, Texas, same place where my son is. And the homeless problem, very similar to San Francisco, has been allowed to fester. It's been if you if you're not if you're not taking steps to try to stop the homeless problem, then arguably you're encouraging it. You can't be one yeah. or the other. You either got to be anti-homeless, uh, and that doesn't mean you're against the people who are homeless, but just against uh, allowing them to literally proliferate and take over the streets. So. My contention is we need easier mandatory confinement. We need to triage these people into two categories, those who can be effectively treated, released back into society, and those who can't. And then we need to come up with creative ways, things like ketamine clinics that can get hardcore alcoholics off of alcohol after everything has failed. You mentioned statistics, 80% of veterans with PTSD or alcoholics have been successfully treated with ketamine, that group that has been treated. Uh, so we need to we need to do things differently than we're doing now. Throwing money at the situation, community outreach, social workers, uh, meeting with, conferring with their clients on street corners, on sidewalks. This stuff isn't working, is it? Well, it, it it's not working, and we say it's not working because the population continues to grow, and it grows at a different rate than our general population does. So. We know it's not directly caused, you know, that it's it's geometrically tied to the general population. And that's that's where we have to start looking. We realized that in the early 70s, we had deinstitutionalization. We said, look, these people can be better served in their community mental health clinics and at home. And what we found out is it's very difficult to take care of people with mental health issues. It's taxing on families that are already burdened. And then the community mental health centers are not able to provide what, what they need because they're, they're so overburdened. And historically, whether it's conservative or liberal politicians in the office, we cut mental health spending because they're kind of a silent population who don't complain. And that has to do with the mythology and stigmatism associated with mental illness. And one of the reasons why I started my nonprofit with mainstream mental health is we have to realize that more people are affected by mental health issues than we want to admit. And it's a human thing. It's not a crazy thing. And if we start dealing with that, we start taking care of these people on the street. However, we end up doing it. We've got to do something different than what we're doing now because it's really not working. Yeah. And the, the fact is that uh, there's a lot of these people living on the streets who will never be able to take care of themselves, will never be able to properly care for themselves, either medically or just the the idea of uh, three square meals a day and a, a, a warm bed to call your own. They need to be supervised. Unfortunately, no one is left to do it but the state, and the state has withdrawn from this activity virtually uh, co almost completely because the barriers to commitment are so high. You need imminent threat to either the person or the community or both. Uh, maybe we need to change the laws here 
And maybe we need to revisit the concept of forced medication because a lot of people get better. They can actually function in society, but then they say, I really hate the side effects of this medication. Rather than looking for a new one, they just stop taking it. And then they revert back to their mentally ill state. So, and then we've got drug addiction and alcoholism. And that pretty much is the majority of people living on the street, although there are economic casualties who are more than likely, more as likely than not to be uh, short-term homeless. Trans they could be right. helped with transitional housing and perhaps training and career counseling, which are worthy goals and should be used wherever possible. But they're the minority of people. You've dealt with the homeless in Austin you know this better than I do. Yes, and and you pretty much describe the population, and it, it's it's tragic because you know the city of Austin is very accepting of them, except for when we have huge uh, turnouts of of uh, tourism. For example, when the F one comes in town, you know the race. Yeah. All of a sudden, it's like oh, there's kind of a roundup, and they kind of pull these people out and get them off the streets, and you know. They usually in, involve the police being involved, and, and that's not appropriate for them. And uh, it, it just becomes this vicious yo-yoing cycle where they go, they get detained, and then they get back out, and then they get upset. They, they have to reset themselves and establish themselves where they're at. It, it's just a really bizarre setup all the way around. Yeah, so we see that in cities all over the world, doctor, that when some public event comes to town where there's they're going to be in the spotlight, what do they do? They go and they clear out the homeless. They say, "You can't right. stay downtown here. You know, you're uh, you need to get out of here, but you can come back in a week, so don't worry about it." And that is Yeah, and that is like the worst thing I've ever heard of. Exactly. And, you know, right now we're trying to, the city of Austin is trying to develop a, a community of those tiny homes like you see on the yeah. on the home and gardens television stuff. And they've got volunteers, That's you know, great. putting stuff together. They purchase land and, and there's certain requirements that include, you know, no alcohol, so no right. drugs and that kind of stuff. And that's yeah. uh, that's going to be hard to, to monitor and maintain, I think. But it's the right idea. Yeah. For, for those who can deal with transitional housing, who are economically wind up being put out of their place, uh, lost job, ill, illness, uh, there's a whole host of perils that can befall any one of us in society. Right. And those people really are worthy of the help because they can be turned around you know, just because yeah. your life is horrible at one point doesn't mean it can't be changed. But the other ones with the dependencies and the illnesses, um, really what the left wants us to believe is that all of the homeless are economic casualties and they're a victim of a horrible capitalist society that is totally unfeeling and uh, causes them, you know, as if, you know, the uh, the chief of police was there putting them out onto the street, but it really doesn't right. work that way. You don't just get evicted from your place in a month. Most cities, many of them, maybe not so much in Texas, but in other parts of the country, won't evict people during holidays. Uh, they will give people another month or two to find alternative housing. It's only as a last resort. So you can go 90, 120 right. days before your eviction actually happens. Right, and having been a, a, a rental property owner here, I know it's over, it's, it's roughly 90 to 120 day process here. If you misfile by one day, it kind of starts all yeah. over. But oh, it's yeah. there to prevent that exact same thing. It's not there exactly. to make, you know, being a landlord difficult. It's to protect those people from being displaced because they hit, a major obstacle, got laid off, whatever. Yeah. You know. Exactly. I mean, it's really what it comes down to. So as far as uh, when you've tried to confine people, uh, it's really a difficult, lengthy process, isn't it? Yes. And, you know, it involves going in front of a judge and presenting data and uh, evidence. And oftentimes my experience when I go before a judge like that, the, the client does it themselves. I mean, it doesn't really matter what my report says. Um, they they tend to suggest that imminent threat to self or others without me ever having to say it. <laughs> it's just yeah. identifying and taking care of those people and, and putting forth a, a, an appropriate
appropriate treatment plan so that we can get them treated as best as possible yeah. and, and help them out, get them on their way. But sometimes the treatment plan really is a confinement plan and it's long-term confinement because there are people you can't do anything with. They've progressed or regressed to the point their illness is so all-encompassing and so devastating yeah that you can't do anything you need to confine these people indefinitely in humane settings and and humane settings doesn't mean sending them to a state hospital i think we as a society can and should do a lot better than just locking people up in state facilities where you know it's like it's like anything else go to a police station in new york city and they haven't touched the place in 50 years. It's falling apart. It's filthy, disgusting. You wonder how the cops put up with it. And that's what these hospitals are like. It's not, it's just abject neglect. These people are locked away and forgotten about, and there's no impetus to, to have humane quarters for these people. So we need to do better as a society for that too. But we, we need to confront the right problem. Uh, homelessness, for the most part, is a mental health issue, correct? For the most part, yes. The majority of it is. And it, it's it's something that, that we need to do as a society to take care of our, our mentally ill and help them have fuller, better lives. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I just think that uh, what I see here, and I'm not an authority on this, doctor. You're an authority. But living in New York City for many, many years and working there for over 40 years, I feel like I uh -huh. am an authority. I'm certainly an, an authority on washing clothes in public restrooms. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm an authority on, uh, on where people uh, sleep, finding the, uh, the safest shelter in public right. terminals. I'm an authority on that because I've seen it so much. And I believe that any person living in a public terminal is mentally ill to some extent, whether it's drug addiction, alcoholism, they've got mental problems here. A lot of the times people get the substance abuse because of the mental illness first. Right. Self-medicating. Chicken, chicken and egg, right? I mean, it really yeah. is. So, so summing it up, uh, we got to do more here. We're spending the money anyway, as a society, the economic costs, lost business of, of just so many negative impacts in our large cities like Seattle, like San Francisco, like Austin, we're paying the cost. And then it's costing $40,000 a year for them to live on the streets. And Hey, wow. we didn't even touch on the big one, doctor, which is a lot of these mentally ill people wind up confined in jails and prisons because they commit crimes or wound up getting into situations. They don't even know what they're doing. And they get sentenced to prison and the prisons are yeah, paying so, for it anyway. So it, Yeah, and, and it's no fault of their own. And essentially, you know, they're just not being identified as mentally ill because then they wouldn't be held culpable and they wouldn't be in prison. Yeah. And but then they have to address the problem. And right. it's this vicious cycle. And I, I see it around here. When we have really like cold fronts come in, we get ice and everything down here, all of a sudden, man, all these people with drug addictions and alcoholism, they get locked up in the drunk tank. It's actually the police department Protect trying them. to help these people survive the freeze. They don't want them to die. You know, they're actually compassionate. There's just limited things they can do. And we need to change that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Also, it's a very complicated problem. I don't mean to be proposing simplistic solutions, but what I can observe and have experienced firsthand is what we're doing now isn't working. It's an experiment 50 years in the making. It's been a complete and utter failure. And there are alternatives other than pumping more and more money into the same failed programs. And you know, as well as I do, there's an infrastructure of nonprofit entities that thrive off of this and are looking uh, to increase their client caseload to get more more goodies from the federal government and the state government and the city. Well, you know, thrive, thrive is kind of misleading. It's not like the people who run them are getting rich. It's it's, uh, you know, there are some of the huge national ones that, you know, you, oh, the CEO makes X amount of dollars right. and all that kind of stuff. But the majority of people in those nonprofits are just making barely enough to get by on their own and they true. could fall at any moment. So Very it's true. kind of a, you know, it, it, it is something that they need clients to keep their, their money 
that's coming in definitely, but uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's not like corporate America. Yeah, but but the, these when, these things are revolving doors. You know, that's the problem. Yes, All these programs yes, yes. offer no long term solutions, no long term treatment, no long term rehabilitation. They just become waypoints in the homeless person's journey through homelessness. I just think we could do better. Hey, so glad that you came back on, Dr. Huber. It's always great talking with you. People want to find out more about you, connect with you on the web. Where do you go? Well, you go to MainstreamMentalHealth.org and check out our, our nonprofit website. And, <laughs> yeah, our nonprofit Uh-oh. website. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, my wife will say, we're not thriving. You know, we've got rid of all, all of our, our rental property and sold our home and trying to keep this thing going along. It's it's difficult, but it's something that needs to happen. And, you know, it, it's it's very much grassroots. And if you want to follow us on social media, go to the bottom of that page. It's there. Or you can go to MainstreamMentalHealth.com and you'll get pushed to our Facebook page. All right. Hey, Dr. Huber, always great to talk with you. Again, uh, be part of the show. Send us an email, kl at com, Twitter feed at Carrie Lutz, and the Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. Dr. Huber, keep up the great work. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Carrie. Have an amazing day. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.